All right, everyone. It is exactly 1 p.m. Eastern time. Therefore, we will go ahead and begin. Again, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Spotlight on Family Engagement in Youth Resources. This webinar is to you by OJJDP's Juvenile Justice Systems Improvements Promising Practices. My name is William Moore, and I am with the NAC Training and Technical Assistance Center. And as your technical host, I would like to take a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform and provide a few announcements to keep in mind. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be published on NTAC's YouTube page. The webinar recording will be archived on NTAC's YouTube channel where you can also view past webinars. For the event transcription and supporting materials, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. For those wishing to download a copy of the PowerPoint slides and other important documents, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here, you will also find an FAQ for webinar participants that will likely address technical related questions. Click on the file name, then click on the download button. During today's conversation, in today's presentation, presenters will address some of the questions posed um, after our meeting. Please type in your questions into the chat box as they arise. And thank you all for utilizing the chat box. For those participating in today's webinar group, please help us count. Please take a minute to go to your chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you are viewing alone, there is no need to type anything at this time. And I'll give everyone a couple of seconds. Please type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. If you're viewing alone, there is no need to type anything at this time. Following today's webinar, attendees will be sent a certificate of attendance. This certificate is sent approximately one hour following the conclusion of the event and is sent via an Adobe Connect thank you email. Please keep an eye out on your email for your certificate. Please note that participants who are only registered and signed in will receive the certificate of attendance. At the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be provided with a link to a brief evaluation about today's presentation. The feedback you provide is used to us in future planning and training. I will now turn today's webinar over to our moderator, Eugene Schneeberg, for today's webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you, William. Um, my name is Eugene Schneeberg, and I'm the project director for the OJJDP-sponsored Promising Practices Initiative. Um, it's my pleasure to be with you all today, and we're in for a real treat as we have some extraordinary subject matter experts from localities throughout the country that are going to share with you. A little bit about my background. Um, uh, prior to my role as the project director for this project, um, I served at the Department of Justice as the director of the Center for Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships at DOJ. And prior to that, I helped to run a faith-based nonprofit headquartered in Massachusetts that helped young people transition from juvenile detention facilities uh, back into the community, helping them to find jobs, mentors, um, get back into school, et cetera. Um, so our agenda for today um, it's really exciting. The webinar is supported by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, which is the juvenile justice arm of DOJ. OJJDP has supported numerous juvenile justice system improvement efforts within states, local communities, and tribal jurisdictions. Um, and so you're going to hear from um, some extraordinary panelists, as I said. We're also really fortunate to have a parent on the line of a 
system involve young person and they're going to share some of the insights and how they've been benefited from family engagement efforts in their jurisdiction. And then we'll make room for question and answer. For you also, uh, as William indicated, you can use the chat box. Um, also, uh, we have each of our presenter bios, um, full bios in the handout pod. So if you want to go and check that out, you can as well. Um, so again, thank you so much for your participation. Um, as I said, uh, OJJDP has been supporting the systems improvement work for some time and um, supports states work to improve outcomes for youth in reentry, pre and post release, uh, in several areas including community supervision, multi-system eff efforts, uh, raising the age of criminal responsibility, as well as enhancing youth access to justice within the juvenile justice system. Now, a number of these OJJDP system improvement efforts have incorporated strong threads of family engagement. And it's because of that consistent theme across efforts that we decide to focus today. Um, and so these family engagement efforts ensure that the transition that youth make back into their homes um, are aided by the, their family to help them navigate um, through the juvenile justice system and afterwards. Um, the OJDP strives to strengthen the juvenile justice system's effort to protect public safety, hold offenders accountable, and provide services that address the needs of youth and their families. Today's webinar will highlight the work of several states and organizations that have undertaken efforts to engage families in youth reentry efforts. Our guest speakers will highlight efforts within their states or locality around youth reentry work, and they'll discuss the lessons that they've learned and the effective strategies that they've used to engage families. Our speakers will identify ways in which increasing family engagement has in turn enhanced youth accountability and has helped youth and families to succeed in the community uh, following their commitment. So I'm thrilled to introduce our first presenter, um, Ashaki McNeil. Ashaki is the program manager at the Virginia Department of Juvenile Justice where she manages the development and implementation of statewide reentry service delivery systems. Prior to her work with the Virginia DJJ, Ashaki worked as a program analyst and dis disproportionate minority contact coordinator with the Department of Criminal Justice Services. And prior to her work there, she spent more than a decade working with the Department of Juvenile Justice and Correctional Education. So Ashaki, the time is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Hopefully everyone can hear me pretty clear. As Eugene said, I am Ashaki McNeil, um, Program Manager for the Reentry Unit in Virginia's Department of Juvenile Justice. And today I will share some information around Virginia's transformation efforts that led to improved partnership and engagement with families of youth who are committed to DJJ. So how did this work begin? In 2014, DJJ was awarded a Reentry Systems Reform Planning Grant to assess our current reentry practices. While a number of good things came from that planning grant, there were two major themes that contributed to our reform around family engagement. The first was the development of a reentry task force, which included representatives from all of the child serving agencies in Virginia. And the second um, was a contract with evidence based associates to look at our existing reentry practices and to make recommendations on how we improve our system. So the reentry task force was made up of agencies such as the Department of Social Services, um, mental health, um, every system that would be involved with the family and a young person when they're in the community. That task force gave us the leverage we needed to build partnerships with agencies whose mission, um, again, is to serve all children and families. In May of 2015, EBA, Evidence-Based Associates, completed a system assessment which includes findings and recommendations that were based on the Council for State Government core principles for recidivism and improving outcomes for youth in the justice system. I think someone has their phone that's not muted and we can hear the coughing. Okay, so um, the overall system recommendations were based on four core principles, but it was the fourth principle that drove our change um, to family engagement. 
And principle four says, tailor policies, programs, and supervision to reflect the developmental needs of adolescents. And according to CSG's white paper, the research suggests the best way to operationalize a developmentally approached juvenile justice system was to formalize meaningful family and youth engagement. Our assessment was set up with gaps and recommendations to fill those gaps. So what were our gaps? Um, basically, we, we did not include families in our decision-making processes and families were not involved in our treatment um, aftercare planning. So prior to our reform, DJJ had two types of decision-making points, our initial staffing and treatment team. Families were notified and they were given the option to attend, but there was little support and flexibility for meeting time. The initial staffing team is a decision-making body that basically determines where the youth will be placed and the treatment programs that he or she will participate in. The treatment team is another decision-making body that meets monthly to review treatment progress and to review cases for change in status. The treatment team and staffing team prior to the transformation mostly include staff and very few parents um, if their schedules allow them to um, attend. So recommendations. EDA made recommendations that would lead to better relationships and gain the trust of families, which then improved our family engagement efforts. So our first recommendation was to increase supports for face-to-face -face visits. We partnered with Assisting Families of Inmates, which is a nonprofit organization in Virginia, James River and Van Gogh Bus Companies, and we provide free transportation to families. Um, the pickup spots are in designated areas throughout the state, and depending on where the family is traveling, we offer that opportunity every other week or um, once a month. The second recommendation was to hire a full-time family engagement coordinator. Hiring a coordinator would give more priority to the work, and you would have a designated person to work with families. So in 2017, we hired a full-time Family Engagement Coordinator. Her responsibilities include staffing our Family Engagement Committee, which consists of youth representatives, family members, and staff. The committee meets monthly. They meet at our Bonaire facility, and those meeting, meetings are driven by a strategic plan that was developed during the start of the subcommittee with the help of Vera. The Family Engagement Coordinator also serves as a point of contact for families, and she manages our ongoing family engagement efforts to ensure the partnership with families is sustained. The third recommendation was to develop tools to track and utilize data on family involvement. So DJJ's system is pretty top-notch, um, but what we did not have was the ability to track family involvement through visitation or participation um, in these decision-making meetings. So we added that feature to our existing system, and we can now track family visits and participation. And most importantly, we use that information to initiate contact with families who are not participating in meetings and to identify youth who do not get visits. To meet the fourth recommendation, we added meetings to intentionally engage families in reentry planning from the beginning of commitment when a youth is first committed, there's an initial family meeting that takes place prior to the youth leaving detention. That meeting is intended to engage families early on, explain what the court order means, explain the, court, the commitment process, and to hear the family's expectations, goals, strengths, and concerns regarding commitment. We also use this time to identify other natural supports who might want to be a part of the young person's life while they're in commitment. Once the youth is placed, there are ongoing monthly treating meeting, treatment team meetings that occur. The parole officer and the counselor now work together to schedule a meeting time that is convenient for the family, and we offer resources to ensure their attendance and participation. Those resources might come in the form of a parole officer providing the family with transportation, or um, the counselor working to make sure that there is a phone in the room 
um, to have it available for a family to call in. And most importantly, we changed our procedures to make families a member of the treatment team, which then ensures they have a voice. So it's important to note that while um, evidence-based associates' recommendations certainly led our reentry reform effort, we were also afforded the opportunity to work with multiple partners at one time, and those partnerships also played a vital role in our transformation effort. And that includes Vera Institute for Justice, Annie E. Casey, and the Missouri Youth Services Institute. So we realized to be successful with family engagement, um, we, we had to focus not on the, only on the positive development of the young people in our system, but also on building stronger relationships with families and developing and sustaining staff who serve them. So with the help of NE Casey, we adopted guidelines, guiding principles to meet the needs of both staff and youth. And those principles include ensuring youth and staff feel safe, youth and staff need to feel connected to, support, to supportive and caring adults, and we wanted to make sure that youth and staff have goals to strive towards. And then most importantly, youth need to perceive their environment and interactions as fair and transparent, and we needed to make sure that staff feel they are treated fairly as well. So focusing on the development and sustainability of staff means we had to find ways to improve interaction amongst staff, youth, and their families. Vera's Institute for Justice trained our staff on the juvenile relations inquiry tool, and it basically works with youth to identify other natural supports that from the community that could be a support to them during their commitment and or when they return to the community. We also transformed our housing units um, inside of Bonaire facility to adopt Virginia's version of the Missouri Youth Community Treatment Model. That model provides consistency among staff, youth, and family, and it promotes a culture where youth are supportive and treat each other um, as family. We increased contacts between staff and families. We relaxed our dress code policies to make families feel welcome and free of judgment. We host a minimum of four family engagement days a year. And during these events, we provide games, food, activities that promote interaction between staff, youth, and families. And probably one of the most important changes is our expanded definition of family. Um, prior to our reform, family was defined as mom, dad, and maybe a grandparent. We now encourage communication and connection with anyone in the community that's identified as a positive support um, to the young person that's in commitment. So engaging families was our overall goal. Um, we believe families want to stay connected, but there are often barriers, situations, preconceived notions, past experiences or their own life circumstances that prevent them from visiting. We believe we can help families by changing our visitation policies to be welcoming and flexible, providing resources and support where we could. Providing free transportation was helpful, but there were still some families who were not able to travel to our facilities, so we um, worked with our um, community partners, and we now have a video visitation program where families can go to a partner in the community and they can call in using um, video visitation. Um, we found it important to give families a voice. Our family engagement subcommittee is all about meeting the needs of families and the youth we serve. Um, we, when we first started the subcommittee, we would initially sit in the room with families, bring up an idea, and we would have our staff do most of the talking, which means um, the decisions for what's best for families were still being made by staff, although families were present. So we found it important to have a designated person to ensure that families' voices are heard when they're at the table. We hired recently a family advocate who is the parent of a formally committed youth. Her responsibility is to be a voice for families and to ensure safe zones are available to hear from families without fear of judgment or consequences. 
And last but not least, um, we are very intentional about inclusion at every decision point. Intentional means um, doing more than simply sending an invite, but following up with a phone call or a visit and offering assistance to ensure attendance. And it also means asking the family if they have input before, during, um, or after the meeting. So we realize what gets written gets done. So in 2016, we introduced the reentry re manual that provides guidance on reentry to all staff through written procedures. Um, it ensures consistency and accountability. And in 2018, we went a step further, and we documented our priorities around family engagement in a strategic plan. And that plan is used to drive the work of the family engagement um, committee. And we are doing a better job of collecting um, our data and most importantly, actually using the data to improve where we fall short. Our family advocate, although she's paid by DJJ, her job is to ensure the voices of families are heard and to hold us accountable to listening. And the family engagement coordinator's role ensures that the family engagement continues to be a priority. So although we're early in the process and we do not have a lot of data, we do know that since our reform, we have had a, um, a little over 90% increase in family visits. 56.3% um, of those visitors were parents or guardians. We have had um, improved staff, juvenile, and family relationships. There is an increase in family participation in treatment team, and very important, um, a reduction in incidents. So that's it for me. Um, I think we answer questions at the end. That's right, Ashaki. Um, so, so I want to say thank you to you, Ashaki. What a informative presentation. Um, you guys have done such an extraordinary job in Virginia. So thank you so much for taking time out of a busy schedule to share with our webinar participants today. And, um, Chucky will be sticking around and she'll be fielding questions after all of our presenters have presented. Thank um, you. So thank you, Chucky. All right. Um, so next um, person you'll hear from is Director Clinton Lacey. Uh, Clinton has over 26 years experience in youth justice, in the youth justice space. For 12 of those years, she's worked directly with youth transitioning from New York City's Rikers Island and then went on to join the W. Hayward Burns Institute, where he addressed racial and ethnic disparities in the justice system. Clinton is a systems leader and has served as deputy commissioner for the New York City Probation Department, and now serves as the director of Washington, D.C.'s Department of Youth and Rehabilitation Services. So Clinton, the time is yours. Thank you, Eugene, and uh, thank you, uh, Ashaki, for uh, starting us off and sharing the great work and the important work that you all are doing there. And greetings to the listening audience. I think it's important to really uh, begin the conversation, my, my conversation that is, um, with some, I guess, historical perspective. You know, I was a history major in college, so I, I tend to sort of think about things in that way at times. And as the slide indicates, there's a, uh, talking about the evolution of the field of youth justice. and and some broad uh, strokes, I want to talk about that in terms of where I think uh, the field is going and what are our, I think, awesome opportunities to continue to build on the work and the types of things that Ashaki was talking about. The punitive era uh, itself is, you know, what I often refer to as the dark ages in youth justice. And we all know that uh, the stories and the history around of youth justice, despite um, that which led even prior to the founding of juvenile court um, in uh, 1898, which of course was a very positive thing, and the people who led that movement. Um, but even leading up to that, and then even after that, we know the stories of real uh, punishment-based um, work, and of course the racial and ethnic disparities that characterize the justice system in terms of assumptions and beliefs around Native youth, around African-American youth, around Latino youth, and around otherwise marginalized um, young people. And so as time would go forward, 
uh, in the reform era, which I sort of refer to as like the Enlightenment, when there was started to be a shift uh, from those more uh, harmful, overtly ugly and hurtful and harmful practices to, um, you know, kinder, gentler, I would say smarter, um, more research-based, evidence-based uh, approaches, which of course has been very important, you know, so evidence-based uh, programs and more emphasis based on um, educated and trained staff. Um, and all of those developments, which I think, and, and also the involvement of technologies um, into the field have been important, um, have been great, has certainly advanced the work. And so there's reform initiatives that we, that we continue to build on and should celebrate. But I think that this era is still, has been largely uh, what I would call self-centered from the point of view of the justice system, uh, that the justice system and agencies have sort of focused on themselves. That is, the, the system's wherewithal, its ability, its technology, its apparatus, its equipment, um, its people to, to do a job, right, to do, to do what it's been asked to do or told to do. Um, but I think uh, there is, it's worthy of a critique, and I think we could push ourselves to even evolving past this smarter, kinder, gentler reform era, because I think it's been, despite the advances, it's been limited because it really has struggled to engage families and communities and partner with them in a way that can really advance the work. Um, and so without those voices, without those experiences, without that expertise involved, even at the level of the policy table, I think the advances um, have been limited. And I think, you know, if we think about the critique of the justice um, reinvestment um, initiatives, how, you know, funds have been reinvested from incarceration and what have you, but have sort of remained within the apparatus of the justice system, but haven't reached the communities where the youth and the families most impacted, most in need, it hasn't reached their communities. It hasn't reached those people doing the work on the front lines, you know, in those, in those very neighborhoods. Um, and so I think as we move forward to a transformative era, then that's exactly what it means, that, that we begin to uh, seek transformation through a new approach with a new level of value placed on families and communities and those very challenged families themselves, right? Those who we are, whose youth we are, who are brought to us from the courts to, to rehabilitate, to reform, uh, to serve. Um, um, that they have a critical role to play and that we can be more intentional about it. And I think it raises a question about our very identity. You know, uh, sometimes in a, in, a, in, a, in a struggle, one might say to someone, who, who do you think you are, right? Who, who do we think we are, the justice system? But I think we should ask ourselves that in the most positive and the most constructive way. How do we define our identity and our purpose and I think that if we can move beyond, and I think it's critical that we do move beyond uh, an identity that defines us as the uh, rehabilitators, the, the, the reformers, the uh, fixers, or whatever language we may use, um, and that we are the sole source of that, of that medicine, of that treatment, of those services, if we can move, shift our identity from seeing ourselves as the sole or primary place uh, where the healing, growth, development, and rehabilitation would take place and start to see that, in fact, um, it's really going to have to take root back in communities, and it's going to have to empower and involve families and neighborhoods um, and grassroots leaders to be part of that. I think that will represent a shift in our identity of how we see our role. And we can start to see ourselves in a different way. Um, I think, lastly, on this slide, that the punitive era was one in which the system did two people. I think that the reform era is more where we've done four people. But I think the transformative era moves us to doing with people and real positive uh, and meaningful partnerships. And so the village, that we all agree and talk about, it takes a village to raise a child. But I think that raises two really critical questions. One is, what is the justice system's relationship to that village? Is the village the place filled with hurt and pain and pathology uh, from which we must rescue children 
and try our best to reform and rehabilitate them? Or is the village a place, yes, with many serious challenges, still the source of answers, the source of people uh, with resources that can be a critical part of the healing process? Second question is, what is the system's investment into that village? You know, justice systems, I don't think, tend to think of, we don't think of ourselves as, uh, you know, investors, uh, facilitators, um, as partners. But I think our greater value, in fact, with all that we have to bring to the table, which is important, that our greatest value is to be facilitators of a process that really empowers children to be in the community or get back to their communities as soon as possible, wrapped around by uh, families, um, and other caregivers and stakeholders who are well-supported, well-resourced, uh, well-equipped, um, in partnership with systems to care for their own children. So we must, I think, shift our identity to be investors um, in the village and, 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 you know, with real dollars and with real resources. And I think it begs the question around the notion of justice reinvestment. How do we reinvest resources to the very families? Um, and the neighborhoods where our children live. I think it's a critical question with regards to uh, family engagement, uh, family support in the juvenile justice system. What we've tried to do and what we've emphasized has really culminated in the Credible Messenger Initiative. Um, it's an initiative that I think in a broad sense has long historical roots, this notion that people with shared life experiences um, often former system involvement themselves um, from marginalized communities who have struggled with incarceration, with substance abuse, with the behavioral health, and all the issues that we know impact the youth and families that we serve, that those folks themselves, many of them, can in fact be and are in a unique position uh, to have the credibility to bring the messages of hope and healing, of restoration, of redemption, right? of transformation. And so we started this in New York City really based on work that's been done around the country in various forms by, by credible messengers. Perhaps they didn't call themselves that. In New York City, we started at the Department of Probation. And um, there's a study by the Urban Institute which shows a uh, uh, roughly 60% reduction in recidivism as a result of those uh, 16 to 24 year olds on probation participating in credible messenger initiative. And so Essentially what it is is, as I said, bringing in, recruiting, training, supporting, uh, developing um, credible messengers, those with shared life experiences from the very neighborhoods um, where our young people and our families live to, to connect to them. And essentially, I think to do what's most important in our work is to form trusting relationships, which, which, which then allows for any further um, progress and growth in terms of offering services, uh, connecting people to resources, and helping young people and their families uh, uh, heal and grow and, 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 and move away from the justice system and hopefully stay, stay away from the justice system going forward. And so this uh, has included parents, our credible messengers, and the initiatives that we've started here in Washington, D.C. has really uh, evolved and advanced what we did in New York in the sense that we have uh, credible messengers now who are, we have parents who are credible messengers. And the credible messengers don't just meet with uh, young people. Um, they also work very closely with families. So if we look at the core components of this initiative, it's really about um, uh, group work as well as you know, individual transformative work. And we have many stories to tell, uh, much of which is being documented in the evaluation that's being done around both crisis intervention, the 3, 4 a.m. phone calls that intervene into what could be potentially very dangerous, even deadly situations, um, to helping to heal family rifts, to proactive uh, engagement of support and encouragement and helping young people and their caregivers navigate processes, navigate systems, um, trying to help them stabilize and then helping them move forward and equipping them with the tools to be the healers of their own children, to take care of their children, to take care of their neighborhoods. So it's really about building community capacity 
Um, and so through group work, through individual work with youth and parents and other caregivers, um, being available 24 hours, and really focusing on restorative justice, having a presence in the community beyond just those kids who are committed to our agency, but actually doing restorative work in the very neighborhoods where our young people live um, are the core components. And this, these, this involves the families, both in terms of um, being the participants in all of this work, and then again, many of the credible messengers, or a growing number of them, are, are family members uh, of the young people um, that we serve. And so, again, back to this notion of a transformative era, how do we uh, transform not just the lives of young people, which of course is our major charge and our major mission, certainly Credible Messenger and community capacity building, uh, uh, we believe, is doing that. But it's also transforming uh, families, right? Transforming communities, and so I, I think that that broader approach is what's critical if there's going to be any sustainability uh, of progress and opportunity for our young people. Um, it's transforming credible messengers as well in their lives. Now we have marginalized people who have purpose, who have, in our case, full-time jobs doing this work, working for nonprofit organizations uh, with whom we partner in the community. But, but, but last and not least, which I think is often left out of the conversation, this work is transforming DYRS, right? It's changing the way we think. It's changing the way we act because now we have embedded in our agency, hand, working side by side with our case managers, with our treatment facilitators, with our staff, with voice in the room, impacting individualized case plans, impacting policy, uh, changing the work, adding a layer of voice, adding a layer of expertise, which uh, we have found to be uh, critical. And of course, the question is around this and any such initiative is how do you how do you pay for that? Like how do you invest? We have a three and a half million dollar credible messenger initiative here in DC um, with some sixty to seventy credible messengers um, working with youth and families around the clock and. We have self-funded this through our, through our budget. In New York, we were the benefit of a windfall of dollars through the Young Men's Initiative, um, millions of dollars uh, that we've got uh, through Bloom, Bloomberg Philanthropies and Open Society Institute. Here in D.C., we have done this through repurposing and reinvesting our dollars from our own budget. We have decreased spending on residential, out-of-home residential placement for our children. Uh, who had historically been sent not not just to group homes locally but around the country. Um, we've drastically decreased the utilization of residential placement and for those who do go um, for shorter lengths of stay. And we've been able to reinvest uh, and repurpose the portions of that money um, back into the community in the form of Credible Messenger Initiative. Um, and so this for us is uh, representative of our efforts um, to both change our sense of who we are and what we can do uh, with regards to partnering with community and investing, putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak, um, and really uh, taking what we think are initial steps towards building community capacity to take their rightful place uh, in the scheme of, of, of youth justice. And I think that rightful place is to be um, respected, empowered, and resourced partners in healing and supporting the growth and transformation of our of our young people. That is uh, um, the last slide for, for this portion of the presentation and looking forward to ongoing conversation. Wow. Well, thank you, Clinton. Um, the work you guys are doing in, in D.C. is just extraordinary, and we're getting a lot of great questions in the chat box. So keep them coming. Um, thank you for your leadership, uh, both in New York and now in our nation's capital. And uh, just extraordinary to hear about the investments you're making and, and the transformation that's going on. So looking forward to a robust uh, discussion during our Q&A. Um, so thank you, Clinton. Um, thank you. Next and last but certainly not least, our um, last presenters are uh, Monica Southwick and Bahaja Kaur. Monica is a licensed mental health counselor 
who currently serves as the Family Engagement Specialist for Roxbury Youth Works, Inc. in Boston, Massachusetts. Roxbury Youth Works is a community-based nonprofit that partners with the Department of Youth Services in Massachusetts to help youth caught up in cycles of poverty, victimization, and violence to transition, to help them transition successfully to adulthood. Before coming to this role, Monica worked as a clinician for DYS, um, as well as in community mental health. Now today, as I said earlier, we have a real uh, treat. We have the, that parent voice represented on our webinar today. With Monica is Bahaja Kaur, who is the parent of a child involved with the Department of Youth Services. Bahaja is here today to talk about how Roxbury Youth Works has helped her um, help them navigate child their child's time with DYS. Bahaja would like others to know that with faith and support, our children can overcome anything. And just before you go, Monica and Bahaja, full disclosure, I grew up in um, in Roxbury, and um, my mom actually used to work for Roxbury Youth Works in the 90s. I know you didn't know that, Monica, but certainly a big fan of, of your work and um, really looking forward to your presentation. So Monica and Bahaja, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, OK, let me get rolling. So um, as was just shared, I work for Roxbury Youth Works, Inc., and we partner with the Department of Youth Services. And this is just a little bit about us, but really just wanted to highlight our mission is to, as was said, help youth caught in cycles of poverty, victimization, and violence to transition successfully to adulthood. And these are just some of our principles um, as an agency. So social justice, quality relationships, respect, understanding, integrity, success, love and caring. And so I am what's called a family engagement specialist within DUIS. Um, and there are five of us for the regions across Massachusetts. I work um, in the metro Boston area. Um, and what our role is, I really see it as twofold. Um, so one that we support families throughout their youth involvement with DYS. So that may look like attending meetings, connecting to resources, assisting with referrals. I really describe myself when I introduce my fam uh, myself to families as really a family go-to. Um, and the second piece of that is I work with the teams that work with our families. So caseworkers, district managers, um, we also have youth um, support as well. Um, so working with each of those individuals um, to really help them best serve our families. And really, um, the role of the family engagement specialist and the goal of this um, is to help enhance family engagement efforts. In the metro region specifically, um, we do this in a few ways. Um, so we have parent groups. I'm going to talk a little bit more about our offering um, in a few minutes. Um, we also um, really work uh, in engaging the youth from the point of when they're committed and the family as well. Um, in addition, we have five district offices, community offices, um, and we do a lot of family engagement events there um, throughout the year as well. And lastly, and I'm going to talk about this next, is um, attending initial home visits and any other relevant home visits with caseworkers. Okay, so the goal of the initial home visit, um, this is when the youth is um, first committed. Um, they will be in an assessment program to decide where they'll be going for treatment. Um, and so the caseworker and myself will go out and really, the goal is to help to get to know the family. Um, and so really, how can we best support the family? Um, things like, so when I go to meet a family, what I may typically be asking is, what are their best hopes while their youth is uh, involved with us? What are they hoping to get out of that? Um, in addition, how can I help them stay connected to their youth? 
Um, so is it, do they need transportation? Um, can I help them by attending meetings? Because um, I think our system can be relatively complicated. So really helping our parents navigate that and understand what the goals um, are within DYF. In addition, I really like to focus on what the resources need, because I think if we're helping the families and we're helping them to get what they need, um, that's, that's a really key piece in preparing for youth coming home. Um, so it may be just that the family needs me to identify resources. I may be going out with them and helping them connect to those resources. And something unique in the metro area is I also have a parent partner who works part-time with me. So she is a parent with lived system experience. And the goal is with my role and with hers, we can work in tandem to really increase family engagement efforts. OK, as I spoke to, we have two different parent group offerings. And Parent Cafe is one of those. Um, so Parent Cafe, as it says, is a strength-based system for parents and caregivers that helps keep children safe and families strong. Um, we really like this group um, because I, I think it's both um, parents are able to receive the support of other parents, but they're also learning as well in the group. Um, for each group, we offer transportation to and from. We have a meal and we have child care. We find those things are so important. Um, and each group, we're going to focus on a different protective factor. I like to bring a really hands-on activity um, and many times something that the parents can bring home as well, a collage, something like that. And the protective factors, as I was alluding to, are um, parent resilience, positive social connection, concrete support in times of need, knowledge of parenting and child development, and social and emotional competence of children. So we highlight a different protective factor each week. And I really try to bring something very practical and tangible to help learn. We also offer Parenting Journey. Parenting Journey is a 12-week structured curriculum. Um, Roxbury Youth Works, we run both Parenting Journey 1 and 2. Um, so there's two um, parts to this. Um, and these groups really help parents reflect on how they were parented um, and how this in turn impacts their parenting. Um, and they also really focus on future goals and helping parents create tangible steps to achieve them. One other um, aspect of family engagement in the metro region is we have a family advisory council. Um, and these are made up of parents who have had youth within the DYS system, um, as well as some professional co-chairs. And we meet bi-weekly. And parents are able to really provide suggestions to DYS around how to further enhance or expand family engagement. One thing the Family Advisory Council was able to do was to create a definition of family engagement in their view, which was passed on to DYS. We also host um, a yearly symposium uh, each year on different topics relevant to uh, what families need. Um, last year, we focused on one in trauma, and we're currently expanding uh, this year's as well. And now I'm going to just pass on um, to Bahaja Kaur, who is our parent. Um, and she's going to share a little bit with you about her experience. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Bahaja Kaur. And I am a parent of a youth that is um, DYS involved. When my son first was committed, he struggled with the fact that he was not coming home. Within the first five weeks, he was involved in three fights. That is what I had to come in, and a plan had to be, be set. Um, I would like to say that um, I, I have a, a very strong team. I would like to say that they, are all, they have, from the beginning, made sure that I was involved with any crisis that my son had. Um, one of my concerns 
was um, the aftermath, what was going to happen when my son finished the program. That was one of my main concerns, um, being that the community that we, that the community that I live in. So my team was helpful with identifying an independent living program, which now my son is um, at where he's living at. Because um, one of my biggest fears was um, safety. That was one of my biggest fears. Um, my son's safety. Um, to, to date, my son is in an independent living program. He has successfully went back to school as well as held down not one but two jobs. I think the key to his success is the communication that myself and his clinicians still, still have. Also, I feel that a program that I was involved in, Piano Cafe, which was ran by Monica, I feel that that program helped me cope with his struggles. This program also taught me there are other similarities, similarities as I. One thing I take from this experience is everyone involved has treated my son and I as a person as opposed to, to a case. And I feel that with that with that being said, we all know communication is key. And the fact that I'm a voice in my son's life and they are still involved with me, I feel that that's everything. And that's that's why he has the success that he's, he's had from the beginning to the end. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Bahaja. I really, we really appreciate you sharing your, your and your son's story. And it's so great to hear that everything is working out well. Um, and thank you, Monica, for uh, for your insight about the work you all are doing in, in Massachusetts. So um, now is the time. We have uh, roughly about half an hour. Uh, that we budgeted for Q&A. And a lot of really wonderful questions have come in through the chat box. Um, and I'm going to um, serve as kind of the moderator of this Q&A session. If you have questions for our presenters, this is the time to ask them. And we will get in as many questions as we can over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So I'm going to um, try and kind of go back and forth between each of the presenters and ask uh, some of the questions that have already came in. So the first question that came in um, is for you, Ashaki. Um, you mentioned um, the fact that you have a family engagement coordinator um, that you guys have brought on. And the question is, is this person an impacted individual? Um, are they, is there, yeah, so I think you know what I mean. Um, say that again, is she, in, is she impacted? Yeah, is there, are they a family member or do they have some sort of no. connection to, to the youth themselves? Okay. So we have two positions. Um, we have a family engagement coordinator um, who is not a, um, who has no experience or contact with the system. And then we have a parent advocate, a family advocate who is the parent of a youth who was formerly in our system. Okay, great. Thank is you that, for making that. Okay. It, it does, yeah. Thank you for making that distinction. All right, the next question is going to go to you, Clinton. Um, the question is uh, how, um, excuse me, can you talk more about the restorative justice work in the communities and how has this been facilitated? Well, one of the issues that, you know, certainly our youth and families are, are facing and, you know, uh, sadly and tragically, you know, we we've been touched um, by that I mean young people who have been involved with DRS have been hurt and some even killed and violence has taken place in neighborhoods which is you know obviously like the worst um, event worst in uh, the spectrum of the of the challenges and, and the horrors that people are facing right and so um, they uh, neighbor what we have here is not traditional gangs as much as more community neighborhood uh, beefs between neighborhoods that go back in time, that go back on another generation, in fact, generations of, of back to even, you know, when there was a, a more sort of drug-related conflicts and what have you. But with that said, there's conflicts persist, and young people are high availability of weapons, um, 
and um, you know, obviously, real real challenges and real real tragedy has has continues to hit the district, and I'm sure this is true in other jurisdictions. And so, our credible messengers, in addition to being transformative mentors in the lives of our youth and families, are also people rooted in communities. Uh, they many of them themselves were out there in those streets uh, to 20 years ago. Um, and know the roots and the complexity of a lot of these beefs that take place that the kids themselves don't really understand. They just know that this area doesn't like that area, and this this block, you know, is at war with another block, and those kinds of things. And so the credible messengers intervene, and have even intervened in a proactive sense, um, helping our young people uh, resolve conflicts, you know, squash beef to to use the uh, colloquialism to mediate situations on an individual basis, but then also proactively working in communities to build peace, right, to break down uh, what's causing these, these cycles of violence and cycles of revenge. And they've even been able to do what we've called peace circles, where we've engaged uh, uh, neighborhoods in conflict and brought the actual players to the table to begin to work with them and, and, to, and to replace what they believe they have or all that they see that they have with real opportunity and resources. And I think our credible messengers are through a restorative process, right, restoration. Um, there's been harm done. Um, there's, there's, there's history of harm. So how do we unpack that, um, repair, and restore? And so that's the work that they're doing um, in actual neighborhoods. And we'd like to do more of it and hope to expand that work. Um, we also go into the jails. The credible messengers go into the local jail uh, to work with the young young people there. They, they tend to be the younger population. Um, on again, uh, resolving issues. So much of the reentry conversation that's that, that's often left out is the actual conflicts and issues that folks are facing when they come home. Right. So it's not just about where you know where will I work? How will I get an education? Which are critical questions. But it's also about are there unresolved conflicts, are there issues that we need to know about so that we can think those through, if we can possibly mediate those situations. So that's the that's the restorative justice role that our credible messengers are playing. Um, in one example of it, I would say. All right, great, thank you, um, Clinton. Um, Monica, uh, this question came in for you. I think in your presentation you mentioned. Um, is it, is it, uh, excuse me, your family advisory council, and uh, someone wanted to know how do you go about recruiting parents? What are some of the strategies you use to recruit parents to participate in that family advisory council? How do you keep parents engaged? Sure. So um, for the family advisory council, um, Many of our parents were outreaching if they're involved in the parent cafe or the parenting journey, um, those types of groups. Um, we're letting them know about this. Um, or if there are particular uh, parents um, that I'm meeting at meetings, things like that. Um, but a lot of our parents, I would say, have um, come through those groups, and that's um, a forum for us to um, to, to get new parents involved. Um, the SPAC is funded by the OJJDP. Um, so parents, um, we are able to um, give parents a stipend for participating. Um, and we find that once the parents get in, um, they really enjoy it. Um, and we found that attendance um, has been consistent w once they get in. Um, so those two factors, um, really, reach, I guess, reaching out to parents who we know have an interest or we know are already connected to us, um, and also expanding the, the word through meetings and things like that, as well as supporting them um, for their time and for their energy coming here. All right, great. Thank you, Monica. Um, a lot of great questions rolling in. I'm going to address this to Ashaki. Um, Ashaki, you mentioned expanding the de definition of uh, family, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the questions came in that talked about how do you deal with some of the challenges associated with that? Um, what if 
there's someone um, who may have a criminal background or someone that you, you may have concerns about, you know, the potential to have a negative impact on that child. Uh, how do you navigate some of those um, challenges and, and how, how have you dealt with that during the expansion of the definition of family? So I think it's um, first important to point out that um, that was one of the concerns that all of our staff had, especially staff that's been around for a long time. Um, but we we have a process where we require our parole officers to um, do sort of a, a, an investigation on, around who the person um, is and what the person might contribute um, to being a part of the young person's life. Um, while you know, we've gotten some encouragement from um, outside organizations to allow um, peer-to-peer visits. Um, we don't do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer unless that, that peer um, is proven to be um, a positive support. It's usually in the area around um, an adult who is a positive influence, and they have to have um, some history that that some positive history um, in the young person's life. So we have a we basically have a process that vets the visitor, um, the parole officer who's in the community um, has to actually meet the person um, and they interview, if you will, the person and talk to the family to see what the connection is. Great, right, thank you, Shaki. Um, next question uh, goes to you, Clinton. Um, how do you deal with, uh, or how do you help young people transition, or how, to, how does your staff help young people transition back to school? Particularly, uh, do you ever run into schools that might be resistant to helping, uh, having wanting that kid back in their school system, and how do you navigate those challenges? Yeah, that's classic. You know, that's just um, one of those issues that I think a lot of people are facing around around the, the country in terms of schools not being, you know, not, not welcoming kids back, right? So, so many of the young people who um, get committed to us are disconnected from school at the time, right? And um, and for in various ways have had, you know, bad experiences there, whether it's just been in terms of academically or also, you know, social, emotionally, or to outright conflicts. And so um, we just have to do a lot of Relationship building back with those schools, um, if in fact that's going to be the place where the child returns. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we are, are creative in figuring out alternative um, options for the young person in terms of a different school, um, what have you. We have um, we're building up and make, strengthening even our our um, capacity internally around educational services. You know. I, there's so many questions you would ask that I would connect back to our credible messenger work who partners with our with our care with our care we call our our community case managers we call them care coordinators and they're essentially uh, sort of analogous to a P a probation officer they're responsible for community supervision for our young people who are in the community most of whom are in the community so the credible messengers work with those care coordinators to often uh, help navigate and literally make sure our kids go to school, right? Like take them, go with them, um, help them develop the confidence and the wherewithal um, to navigate whatever the particular issue is they need to navigate to get back into school. And then on our end, of course, we are fighting, you know, the bureaucratic, doing the, the, the bureaucratic uh, navigation, right, to get kids back in. So that's there's no panacea, you know, at this point, no perfect answer, but it's something that we grind we grind out day to day, you know, case by case, really trying to advocate. I do think, though, one thing I would layer the conversation with with regards to education and court-involved or system-involved young people, um, those in the community, and I think this is true as well as those who are in secure settings, is that there is... Um, adequate attention paid to an investment in, you know, the social, emotional, and other factors that really are prerequisites to any kind of academic achievement, right? And so I guess that's pretty obvious to us who do the work, but it's something that um, systems aren't always built for, right? And so we really try to be intentional about making sure that our young people are have what they need 
um, in order to even succeed in school once we've been able to open the door to get them in. Great, thank you, Clinton. Um, a question came in for Bahaja. Um, question came in and says, um, you spoke about how communication is key. Uh, this individual would like to know kind of what forms of communication were most helpful and did you utilize? Was it by phone, email, face-to-face, -face, uh, or another means? So Bahaja, what, what type of communication did you find, find beneficial um, for you? Uh, yes, good afternoon. When I say um, communication is key, I mean um, us as a parent having a, a child in um, DYS, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of stress on us, um, emotional um, stress, to say for my, myself. Um, when I say communication is key, for instance, I'm going to give an example of Monica, for example. I, when I met, Mo I met Monica into the 90 days that my son was going to be complete, completing um, his DYS um, term. When Monica, when I, as soon as soon, right, say as soon, as soon as I met Monica and I, I told her my needs, like she was on it like immediately. As far as the communication, it, it is over the phone, but it's a lot um, um, face, face to face as well. So they, uh, my team, I'm going to say my team because they're my team, and Monica is a part of my team. They have taken a lot of stress off of me being a parent, having a DYS. Our child involved with having a DYS child um, because for them too as well it's a lot of stress on the child too like like I said when my son first got there um, he was just like all over the place he was very angry and while he was at the DYS uh, facility, facility I actually had to meet um, with the team we met I actually met with them every month that's what I did not share I just didn't want to be so broad, but I met with them every month, and everyone was always on board. Everybody was always involved. But the thing is, to me, is they they wanted to know my voice, my opinion, what I felt, and that to me was very important. Awesome, thank you, Bahaja. Um, Ashaki, I know that your work covers the entire state of um, Virginia, and uh, one of the questions that came in was how do you provide uh, family engagement support to families or young people who may come from rural communities and where you don't necessarily have like an, an office per se? So we, um, interesting, in Virginia, um, one of our rural areas is Southwest Virginia and they do a good job of not committing kids. They deal with the kids. Um, in the community and work with the local um, detention centers. So we don't get a lot of kids from that area. But the kids we do get from that area, um, we we try to get the family to them um, versus um, waiting until they're back in the community. All of our communities have um, court service unit offices, but we also equipped our parole officers with laptops. Um, and, and that laptop allows them to sit in a family's home um, and actually call in to the facility where the kid is, um, and the counselor can actually have that kid on video. Um, in the Danville and Roanoke area, um, which are pretty um, far distance from our facility and where we have a good number of kids committed, we worked with um, Department of Social Services and the Department of community and housing development in um, Roanoke. And we actually put computers in one of the nonprofit centers. And so families can travel to that center and actually call in um, on a designated day and time of the week to visit with their kids. So we, we basically just try and utilize um, technology where we can. Um, but we don't have um, the issue of a, a community that wouldn't have access to an office. And we even have parole officers that will transport our families. We had a parole officer to drive one of our family members three and a half hours to get on the bus and the bus water to Bonaire. And then the, the PO picked her up when she returned back to the community. So a lot of it, like I said, is making sure that our staff are on board. We had to change the culture some of our staff, the way they think about family members, because we can't do the work without the parole officers and without the staff that work in the facility. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so again, a lot of really uh, exceptional questions have come in. Um, Taki, we'll stay with you. You mentioned utilizing the JRIT tool that Vera, mm -hmm. I think, developed. Um, someone was intrigued by that and wanted to know, is that available to the public or is that something that you had to kind of have a contract in place with Vera to be able to utilize or, or view? We had a contract in place with Vera. Um, it was during the time our grant was available, so we um, had resources to pay them. Um, and they basically trained all of our um, residential staff that work with the kids. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. I'm going to throw this next question out to um, any of our presenters who want to take it. So come first, serve. Um, what about, here's the question, what about youth who don't have good relationships with their parents or whoever their guardian is at the time? How do you help family and youth develop relationships with other groups? Um, and that's the, the case. Well, I would jump in, um, which is the case very often, strained relationships um, and even situations where there's been great great harm and pain, you know, and tragedy within family. And so that's so much a part of our work. I think it does relate to our previous question around restorative justice and restoration itself, right, and repair and healing. And so this is, this is so much of the work that we do. We, we partner with, uh, with a community partner, um, an organization called Anchored in Strength, which is our family engagement partner who works with us very closely, very hand in hand, really, you know, a part of our of our organization in a very real way of working with families um, individually and collectively, um, going on retreats, uh, taking families away um, to engage in uh, healing, healing circles. Um, and other other forms of of relationship building, um, you know, some of the, some of the work is certainly in, uh, uh, much of it is informed by what we know via research and um, science around around social work and around psychology and what have you. And and a real part of the practice, though, uh, is. Uh, having presence and relationship and being in community with family, you know, we 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 cry with them, right? We we eat with them, we laugh with them, we have relationship. That presence, that trust building, that process um, is a very important part of what we do. So it's so it's not just sort of uh, traditional sort of uh, facilitated uh, didactic services and and classes and curriculum, you know, that has its place for sure. But so much of it is being in community and really, you know, we have grandmothers and other caretakers who will who will tell stories and, and very honestly talk about how initially they weren't, there wasn't trust with us. They weren't interested in hearing what we had to say or what our approach was or our intentions. But over time, with consistency and care, um, we have we, we've, we've formed relationships and been able to assist healing to take place um, uh, between between family members. I, this might be a great opportunity, I think, on this question, just to to uh, use what I call the L word, and that is that we you know love that we think uh, we we sort of un, we're unashamed in in claiming that and stating that as the principle upon which we build our work and that. You know that that's a that's a part of our approach that we do what we try to do and try to facilitate and support what any family needs to do when it's challenged. Right, um, is to rely on and 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 emphasize its love and care and patience as it heals. Thanks, Quentin. L O V E. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, I have, I have a question that came in from Monica. And while I'm teeing up this question, for, for the rest of our presenters, um, after, after Monica answers this question, if there's anything that you maybe wanted to say but you didn't get a chance to say, 
or you want to respond to or piggyback on another question that another presenter answered, I'm going to make room for you guys. So just prepare that. Um, so Monica, um, you mentioned the 12 week curriculum, I believe, and a couple questions came in related to that. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what the outline or the kind of curriculum you guys use for those 12 weeks? And um, you know, 12 weeks is a long time. And how do you um, how do you keep the you mentioned the, the stipend, but are there other strategies that you use to uh, keep parents engaged over the course of those 12 weeks? Sure. So parenting journey, um, they actually. Um, they have a location in the Boston area, and they also have one in New York as well. And so they do formal um, trainings on that. So that's, um, that's how we came to receive that curriculum is several of us ac across the agency were trained specifically in it. Um, we find this to be really beneficial. I think our parents really enjoy it. Um, in terms of family, uh, getting families engaged related to this. So for groups, um, what we like to do, and particularly with um, the parenting journey, because it's a 12 week and it's a you know, very intensive curriculum, is we like to um, offer like some gift cards and other incentives as it, we go through to really um, reward that. I think it's a, it's a big commitment and to really reward and encourage those parents for going through that and for participating. Um, so that's something that we do within our group. And um, Parenting Journey, if you look it up, you should be easily able to find the website with information about when their trainings are held. Great. Thank you, Monica. I appreciate that. Um, so as I said, I want to make room. Any of our presenters, uh, you want to pick up on any of the themes that have come up or anything that you wanted to share uh, before we go, go back to our, our audience questions. Yes, hi. Um, this is Baha'i Jakor. I'm the parent. And I just want to say thank you for having me, um, for hearing my voice, and for hearing from a parent's um, perspective, from a parent's point of view. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bahaja. Well, you, the timing is perfect because I'm coming back to you with our next question. Um, so what advice would you give to other parents of justice-involved youth um, in terms of the uh, family resources that you've learned? I would say um, don't be scared to ask for help. Um, Sometimes people are ashamed to ask for help. I have to learn um, not to be ashamed to ask for help, that everyone needs help um, one one time in their life. Everyone, uh, whether uh, whatever uh, walks of life you're from, that everybody is going to need help. I would say um, find, out, find out what resources are available. That's another thing. A lot of us sometimes, we don't know what's available to us, so we don't know what to ask for. So ask questions, you know. That's something that, uh, even, for example, when you go to the doctor, they say, um, do you have any questions? Ask questions. I, there's never, there's no such thing as we know as a, a dumb question. Ask as many questions because that's the only way you are going to be able to learn. I got to tell my children, learn, when they leave for school, learn something new every day. Thank you so much. Um, Clinton, this question came in about credible messengers program that you guys operate. Do you have any, um, you know, early uh, outcomes data that you guys have been able to track about the Credible Messengers uh, program? Well, a great question. Other than the, you know, the data that was, um, the evaluation that was done by the Urban Institute in the first iteration of it in New York City, as I mentioned earlier, showed those uh, 50, I believe it was like 59 and percent reduction in recidivism um, of those who participated in the initiative since uh, coming to D.C. and evolving the model to be inclusive of, of, of families. And also the Credible Messengers here are full-time, uh, uh, paid full-time uh, employees of the organizations that they work with in the community. Um, 
we have engaged in a, an evaluation. It's being evaluated by professors from John Jay College of Criminal Justice and also Howard University. And um, so the, the interim findings for them have been more qualitative um, in terms of the, what, what they're seeing in terms of a, an evolution and the feedback uh, from families and from young people have all spoken very highly of transformed relationships, of empowerment, of changed attitudes, um, of, of um, changed um, trajectory of the young people and their families. From a quantitative point of view so far, what we've seen, and it's correlative at this point, but over the course since we've implemented Credible Messenger here in D.C., we've experienced a 50 percent reduction in recidivism. It, before we implemented it, it was at 40 percent, and since we've implemented it, it's at 20, roughly 20, rough numbers. So one one correlation there, which, and, and so we certainly at the end in another year, we'll have a full evaluation done with both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, uh, to you know, sort of speak to to the approach. I, I think it's fair to say that our our approach has been more ethnographic um, than some other more traditional um, approaches. We're not doing ran blind random assignment for a number of reasons, which is probably another webinar to talk about. But um, but we are doing an evaluation, and we um, we're really hopeful about it, and we'll continue to share as it unfolds. Very very. Um, thank you, Quentin. So we're coming down the, the pike. We have about seven, eight more minutes. Um, William, I'm cognizant. I know we have some housekeeping things we need to do at the tail end, um, but I think we have time for maybe a few more questions and answers. Um, one question came in, and, and this is for anyone who wants to take it, um, but the question really related to out of the uh, number of parents and family members who are offered services, um, so the total number of families that are outreach to, how many, what percentage of those families actually take advantage of the services that are offered? Um, so anybody who wants to take a stab at that, it doesn't have to be an exact number, but just all parking. Is it 100% of parents um, who are offered the services take you up on them or 50%? Just trying to get a sense for scale. So Eugene, this is Ashaki from Virginia. Um, Definitely not 100% um, of parents taking us up on the offer, um, but I w would say when we first began um, the work, the initiatives that we're doing, we had a very low um, participation, rate of participation from families, and we noticed um, the increase when we put the parent, the parent advocate started with us as just a parent of a kid with a voice. She just had a voice and she was not afraid to use her voice. And so she became um, sort of our communication um, connection to family. She would talk to people at visitation. And that's when we noticed the increase in, in things like um, the Family Engagement Subcommittee. So it seems as though, um, similar to what Clinton does in D.C. with Credible Messenger, even the families want to hear from um, someone who's going through the same thing that they're going through. Yes, so much, um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just saying, um, you know, we we offer, um, it sort of relates to the evaluation question too, we offer and provide credible messenger services really to all of our youth committed to us. Um, and so, uh, and to their families. And while we had, and so I think a snapshot of that participation would, would have us with over half of our families, you know, I would say actively engaged. It's a process though. Um, and we sometimes, it's a relationship building. And so it might take a while for some family members to formally participate or to come to family group meetings. And some may never come, but we meet them at their home. Or sometimes we ring a doorbell five times for over the course of a month before there's an answer. And there's a, and then that might take another month for us to break through. So it's a great question. And it's something that we're going to uh, measure and talk about 
and more length in the evaluation, but it's it's just it's it's a process. Great. All right, thank you. Um, so we we just have maybe two more minutes. Um, and um, Ashaki, I, you presented um, for a roundtable we had not too long ago in D.C. and you mentioned um, your work with the Virginia Fatherhood Initiative, and I was wondering if you or other presenters are interested in talking about your work to specifically engage uh, fathers of the children in your care. So we don't um, we don't have a formal relationship with the Fatherhood Initiative. We have um, some of our um, localities that have fatherhood initiative programs that work with our court service unit. What we have in um, Bonaire, in our facility in Bonaire, is a, um, a fatherhood group. It's a program um, that supports the young men who are fathers. Um, they have, you know, different events that encourage the mother of the child or some other support to come in with the child, um, and they go through relationship building, um, how to, you know, spend time with the child, and even how to communicate um, with a child as well as communicating with um, the guardian of um, who that child might be. Um, so we don't, we don't at, at the state level partner with the Fatherhood Initiative, but our court service units who are um, at the local level have those relationships when the kids are, when the youth are back in the community. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shaki. All right. One last question, um, and uh, the question is: How do you uh, provide support to kids who may be kind of dual sentenced to um, maybe the Department of Corrections as well as the Department of Juvenile Justice? Are there any um, different approaches that you take with working with those young people? So this is a, a shock again. We have a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Corrections. Um, and if they are being released to community supervision under the Department of Corrections, the agreement allows our reentry advocates to continue to work with them um, while they're on supervision in the community because we um, offer more intensive services. We also um, have started a practice of going back to our judges and asking our judges to release um, the youth to our supervision um, and then transfer them over to adult supervision um, once they've completed services. If it's a young person that's going into um, Department of Corrections commitment, um, we have a memorandum of agreement that allows a, a committee or a treatment team um, to come together to plan for things like program involvement um, when that young person goes over to the Department of Corrections. All right, well, all right. I want to thank all of our presenters. Unfortunately, we're, we're, we can't take any more questions, um, but, but I'm going to turn it over to our uh, webinar moderator and coordinator, William, who's going to give you some final instructions. So, William, the time is yours. All right, great. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you very much for everyone who's joined us for <laughs> Today, I just have a few last-minute announcements for you all to keep in mind prior to your departure. Please remember that you are able to contact INTACT through the website displayed on this slide. You can be up to date on the latest information by signing up for INTACT TTA list service, well, where you'll find out about great webinars like the one we had today. Um, also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook at OJJDP TTA. You can also contact the OJJDP, um, OJJDP via the help desk by following the contact information on this slide. And do you have a TTA need? Well, then please submit a request for help via the OJJDP's uh, TTA 360 platform through the link displayed on this slide. As a reminder, the Webinar recording will be archived on Intact's YouTube channel where you can also view past webinars. And for the transcript and supporting materials, please contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk. Please take a moment to review the disclaimer here. And lastly, we would appreciate it if you take about five minutes to complete the webinar evaluation. 
again, thank everyone for joining us today. Have a great afternoon.